Hi, good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kara McCaniel. I'm the clinical manager for the Baycrest Behavior Support iReach team. Welcome to this month's behavioral support rounds. Happy New Year. This is our first behavioral support rounds for the year. Today, this session is um, entitled Exploring the Enhancing Care Program Support for Caregivers of People Living with Dementia Across Ontario. So some um, little items to go over the land of, land of acknowledgement to begin. So although we are meeting virtually, we acknowledge that Baycrest and our related to Toronto Central Region Behavior Support Programs operates on the traditional um, territories of many Indigenous nations, which have cared for the land of thousands, for thousands of years, including the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, uh, and Huron-Wendat peoples. And we recognize the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land remains home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land today. You may live and work in different territories, so we encourage you to reflect on the land on which you are located and to consider your relationship to the land and to the people who are the traditional keepers of the land. Um, some basic participation guidelines. This session is being recorded as you would have heard and will be archived on the Ontario CLRI and BSO websites. Your microphone is automatically muted. We will have 40 minutes of presentation approximately followed by 15 minutes of discussion and wrap up. Please place any questions you have in the Q&A. If you have uh, questions related to tech support, please message Agnes. So you'll see her listed as telehealth Agnes. Um, for those of you who are interested in receiving a certificate of attendance, please enter your name and email address um, in the completed evaluation form that you will receive. So in terms of introducing our speakers, today we have Cheryl Miller and Kaden McLean. So Cheryl is the Provincial Program Manager for the Enhancing Care Program at Sinai Health. Cheryl's 30-year career spans public, private, and non-for-profit uh, profit sectors in Canada and the U.S. and includes health planning, health database, and reporting cons uh, consulting, technology project management, and health program management. Cheryl has experienced uh, dementia as an informal care partner, service provider, program manager, student researcher, and close family member. Cheryl's interests related to older adults include digital health literacy, end of life, and MAID, medical assistance in dying, um, equitable access to health and community care, co-housing and family caregiving. Katie's uh, uh, introduction includes that she's a personal experience with dementia, led, uh, which led her to a career in supporting people impacted by dementia as a social worker with the Alzheimer Society of Toronto, or AST, in addition to providing counseling support to individuals living with dementia and their caregivers, Katie leads Alzheimer Society Toronto's Enhancing Care Program, facilitating psychoeducational programs to, to help caregivers uh, adapt to their roles and understand and respond to dementia symptoms. Prior to joining AST, Katie worked as a social worker for Sprint Senior Care, a nonprofit community based agency in Midtown Toronto. She has extensive experience in case management, interdisciplinary teamwork, assessment, counseling, and group facilitation, and utilizes a client centered approach to her work. Thank you so much for joining us today. And without further ado, I'm going to switch over um, and allow them to share their PowerPoint. So, welcome. Thank you so much, Kara. It's great to be here today. Uh, so yes, I will go right into uh, sharing our presentation. Hoping everyone is able to see that. Uh, so yes, today we are going to be talking about uh, a program called Enhancing Care. Uh, which includes two groups called Teach and Carers. Uh, so I am Katie McLean, social worker here with the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, and I'm here presenting with uh, Cheryl Miller uh, from the Reitman Centre, and you'll hear from Cheryl in, um, in a few moments. And to start things off, we uh, don't really have anything to, um, to disclose in terms of any um, commercial interests or any commercial support. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is letting you know about the Enhancing Care Program in terms of how, how it was created, what the goals and principles are. Uh, specifically, we'll tell you about the Teach and Carers groups, and we'll talk about the intake assessment um, and group participation aspects, and then we'll leave some time for questions, as Kara had said. 
So our learning objectives for today specifically are to learn about the enhancing care programs uh, background and the principles, learn about uh, the teaching carers groups and how they support caregivers, uh, care partners across the province. Uh, we'll also talk about how to make referrals to the enhancing care program. So I'll pass things over to Cheryl to uh, provide a bit of the, the history of the program. Go ahead, Cheryl. Thanks, Katie. So before the Enhancing Care Program, Sinai Health had a strong outpatient geriatric team that included geriatric psychiatrists, mental health clinicians, adult educators, and researchers. And they developed this evidence-based skills group for care partners of people living with dementia. And they demonstrated a need and an interest outside of the Toronto area for this program in Ontario. So as a part of the Ontario Dementia Strategy, Sinai Health received funding in 2018 to provide CARES groups to care partners across Ontario. And at that time, the ministry wanted to see it in all 14 uh, LINs. And now we're focusing on the six new Ontario health regions. So we started with four partners in 2018. All of them were Alzheimer's societies. And we've expanded now to 14 partners, including three hospital-based community seniors health um, program providers in 2023. I just want to add that we do serve up to 1800 care partners a year and we provide eight to 12 cares groups in each of the 14 partner site areas at this time. Thank you, Cheryl. And so in terms of the, the program principles, first of all, uh, we wanted to touch on the fact that it is an evidence-based program. So it began as a pilot project and they did, um, they gathered pre and post intervention data from the group participants. And they were looking at things like um, caregiver depression, uh, feelings of um, feeling overwhelmed, mastery, um, role captivity and overload, competence. And what they found was that the, the findings did support that the group was effective. So they published the uh, the results in the journal World Junior uh, Journal of Psychiatry in 2013. And I'm going to just read a quote here. Um, it supported the effectiveness of the program in terms of improving caregiving competence, stress, coping ability, and mental well-being uh, in carers caring for family members with dementia. So in the, the group, we're also focused on um, the value of therapeutic relationships. And we want to, um, we really want to make sure that we feel a, a connection and, and the group participants feel a connection with us as the facilitators. Uh, so we spend a lot of time getting to know the caregiver and we'll talk more about that when we uh, talk about the assessment portion of um, accessing these groups. Uh, it's not that someone will sign up for a group and then we we just know their name when we start. We really get to know them and their, um, their specific challenges and um, caregiving situation. Also with the group, we're focusing on the challenges that the, the caregivers have specifically. We're focusing on um, what they are dealing with day in and day out, what's really uh, coming up as challenges for them and some stumbling blocks for them. Focusing on what we call problem solving techniques or problem solving therapy, um, as well as communication strategies. And the, the group has been designed to accommodate the needs of adult learners. So we do focus on, um, on what their learning goals are and we use experiential learning in the form of uh, simulations or role plays in the group, which is a, a unique feature of the Enhancing Care Program. In terms of the goals of the group, Basically, what, what I like to say we're trying to do is give caregivers um, tools for their toolbox that they can try. And if one technique doesn't work, they might try something else. We're trying to make things easier, make life easier for them, and try to help to um, help to support um, the relationship they have with the person that they're caring for. We're also trying to help them to get in tune with their emotions to see um, to see the link between how they might be feeling and what's happening at the time when they might be feeling that frustration, they might be feeling that anger. Um, we want them to feel like they um, they have some control and they have some understanding of what is happening to the person that they are caring for. And sometimes that can help to, um, to influence how they approach different challenges. Um, and again, with uh, these techniques that we talk about in the group, we're really trying to um, enhance the relationship between what we call the care partner and the, um, the care recipient. Um, 
And we want to try to, again, make life easier for them, try to reduce um, care burden and depression. And how we do this is through the two groups. So there is TEACH, which is training, education, and assistance for caregiving at home, and then CAREers, which is coaching, advocacy, respite, education, relationship, and simulation. Um, I'll first talk about the, the TEACH group in more detail. So the TEACH group is, I sometimes describe it like uh, getting the lay of the land of being a caregiver of someone living with dementia uh, or caregiving for Dementia 101. So it's a four week group um, that meets for 90 minutes per week. And in the group, we have a minimum of five and a maximum of eight care partners. And these are all uh, non-professional caregivers. So they could be a spouse, they could be um, an adult child, they could be a sibling, it could be a friend, someone who is supporting a person living with dementia uh, in some way. So in the, the teach group each week, we have a different topic. So um, in the first week, we talk about self-care, um, what do we mean by self-care? What gets in the way of self-care? Why is it important? In the second week, we talk about navigating the health and social service system. So what, um, what are things that people are using? What resources are out there that can be helpful in, uh, in the caregiving journey? Um, in the third week, we talk about um, the, the changing relationship, how your role as a care partner um, might be changing. You might feel like you've gone from being a spouse to being more of a, um, a caregiver, or you might feel like you've gone from being an adult child to a, a parent to your parent, depending on what your role is. And this is the, the session where we talk a lot about um, feelings of grief and loss that might not immediately become apparent a when people are... Um, are entering into this role and it gives them an opportunity to really reflect on what their um, experience has been like and also think about what skills or resources they might need to continue on in that role. In the fourth week, we talk about um, the future care planning. So we might talk about long-term care, we might talk about um, respite care, about powers of attorney. And in the group, we're really focusing on what though these particular group members want to learn. What are the things that are, um, that are of interest to them? And also what are some things that are um, helpful for what other caregivers have found helpful to, uh, to learn about, so. There we have all four sessions. Um, and we will follow up with some resources as well that uh, people may have, um, we have, may have touched on in terms of a dementia symptom. Sometimes people like to bring their own resources and say, I found this book really helpful or um, this podcast really helpful. And we will share those with them, um, with the other group members as well. After the teach group, we have our carers program. So the carers group is an eight week group, um, which is um, two hours per week. And in this group, we have a minimum of five and a maximum of six care partners, six group members. And it's uh, like the teach group, it is a closed group. Uh, people need to sign up for all all of the sessions. And we have um, at AST specifically, we have one group specifically for spouses, and we have one group for um, for what we call friends and family. So that can include adult children, that could be siblings, again, that could be friends or uh, nieces, nephews, sometimes grandchildren um, in the group. Um, and at AST here at the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, we also run groups specifically for um, people caring for a person living in a long-term care home. Um, and we also offer these groups both online and in person, depending on what our um, our clients are looking for. So with the um, with the carers group, uh, we're focusing on practical skills. We're looking at what are the challenges that are coming up, and what are the emotions coming up along with those challenges, and we teach a, a structured approach. Uh, it's an eight step process to address different challenges. Um, and going through that, we're, we're really focusing on that particular challenge that the caregiver is dealing with that week. So we're not focusing on things that had happened in the past. We're not talking about hypothetical challenges. It's what, what happened in the past week since we last met um, that was challenging for you. And we're also asking, how were you feeling when that happened? Which is an opportunity for people to say, I felt angry. I felt frustrated. I felt really sad when this happened. And we can try to help to make a link between their emotions and, and the things that are happening. And we actually try to separate the emotions from the challenge because we, we find that people can sometimes get so 
caught up in a challenge. And I think we, we've all been there that we can't really see beyond it. And so what we do in the carers group in the, the first few sessions is the problem solving therapy or problem solving techniques, where we take one of those challenges that someone has brought up and we do a, a deep dive is what I like to call into that challenge. So we want to know what for you is problematic about that situation? Because two people, two group members who could have the same problem might have um, that problem for different reasons. So we want to know how it, is it a problem for them? And we want to know what would make that not be a problem anymore? What would make this problem kind of go away or not have so much significance in your life? Uh, from there, we actually do a, um, a uh, brainstorming session where everyone is able to give some suggestions about um, about what they think might be helpful because the they are listening with... Um, uh, kind of clean ears, so to speak, um, to the situation, fresh eyes, so they might have a different perspective. And we then have the caregiver evaluate each suggestion because we know with, with brainstorming, we don't want to shut anything down, any ideas down right away. We want to really have some different ideas and unique perspectives flowing. And the caregiver will then choose uh, one or more solutions that that they'd like to try and we make a plan. Um, I sometimes like to joke in the group that I will get annoyingly specific with the plan uh, because we know that our, our clients are often quite overwhelmed and we don't want to add another, um, another thing for them to do. So what we really do is talk about after you leave here today, when are you going to have time and how will you be able to integrate this plan into your week? What is feasible for you? And they might actually say, you know what, I, I can't do all of those things. I'm going to take one part of that and try to implement it. And then they report back the next week and say, you know, I, I tried this and I needed to do a bit of a tweak. And this was the um, the outcome. And if needed, if it turns out that wasn't really helpful, we sometimes go back to um, to the challenge and see if we need to make some adjustments for uh, for the caregiver. The other thing that we do in the um, in the group is what we call simulations. Um, and I'll be sharing a, a video about simulations in, um, in just a few minutes. So in the group, we have a person who has been trained by the Reitman Center to be um, a simulated patient or a simulated person. They um, usually take on the role of the person living with dementia and they um, they will role play with the caregiver for the, the next half of the group. So for weeks um, five, six and seven, to um to help us to educate the caregivers about communication and dementia and what changes with um, with communication when someone develops dementia. So what we um what we do is if someone uh, brings up a challenge related to communication, um, we will choose it to work through. And an example I often use when I'm explaining the group to um, to potential group members is someone might say, uh, yesterday, I was driving to um, to an appointment with my husband, and he started to tell me, you're going the wrong way, you have to turn around, we're going to be late. And the more I tried to say, don't worry, I know where we're going, it's fine, the more upset he got, and we ended up yelling at each other. So we would actually take a portion of that um, that interaction. The simulated person or patient would um, would ask some questions about what was their tone of voice and what did they say, basically kind of writing the script of verbatim, what did they say? Um, and then we role play that just usually it's about uh, 10 to 20 seconds to give us a sense of uh, the rest of the group, a sense of what that looks like. And then we talk about it. We talk about what, how the caregiver is feeling. Did that feel accurate? How the care, um, how the simulated patient is is feeling as well. Um, and they give quite honest, um, in a very sensitive way, but they do give very honest feedback about how um, how they felt. And we'll we'll see that in a moment with um, with the video. Um, I wanted to share, as you can see here on the slide, some common things that will come up um, in the in the group, so if someone might say, I have no time for myself, that might be something we address as a problem solving techniques. Um, someone might say, my husband wakes up at 4 a.m. and he won't go back to bed. He thinks it's time to, to go to work or he thinks it's just time to get up for the day. Um, someone might talk about bathing. That comes up quite a bit as I think everyone can appreciate. Um, and then we can see some things with uh, some challenges with apathy where the, the caregiver really wants to involve the person in activities, but the person living with dementia um, is quite content to stay at home. So what I will do now is share 
um, share the video and I hope we don't have any challenges with um, with audio. So this is a video that was developed by the Reitman Center um, to illustrate, it's, it's available on um, on one of the websites and I'm happy to share the, the link after afterwards. This will show um, a simulation it's very, very similar to how we do things in uh, in the group. We have a lot of fidelity to uh, to the program as it was designed by the Reitman Center. So this gives a, a sense um, from beginning to almost almost the end um, what that looks like in practice. So I'll go ahead and play that. Harriet is constantly interrupted at work by her mother's phone calls. She is having difficulty performing her work and is feeling completely overwhelmed. She worries that her job might be at risk. Harriet learns to acknowledge her mother's emotions, distract her with subjects she still enjoys, and to set reasonable limits on the number of times she will answer her mother's phone calls at work. So Harriet, Hearing how this week has been, it's been intense. It's been really busy. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the phone calls from home have been escalating. Yes. Okay. Yeah. What's hardest about that for you? What's hardest is that I, I can't get any work done. Okay. It, and it's the same questions over and over again. I, she knows. Okay. Huge changes because of mom's dementia and it's impacting your work. I know mom's calling at home, so it impacts there too. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's some strategies we can give you to kind of help with all these changes mom's going through so that you can also get back to the thing, other things that are important in life, work and your family. Mm -hmm. One of the ways we do that is we kind of do a simulation and we practice. Okay. So that's gonna mean giving some of the details of one of the specific times mom has called. So if you can okay. think of maybe the most recent time that mom's called, and I'm going to get you to give the details of that time to mm -hmm. Suzanne, and then we're going to, we're just going to run through it just how it happens, okay? Okay. All right. Suzanne? Okay. Um, the most recent. Well, I guess, you know, yesterday was a big one. It's when I just got so exasperated, and I hung up the phone on her, and I got, I just felt awful about it. She um, called, and she called. She acted like it was the first time that we spoke, and it was actually the third time, and it wasn't even noon yet. And she wanted to know if I was coming over, when laundry day is. The other thing, the dentist. Oh, my gosh. She called, like, 20 times, at least 20 times in the week, wanting to know when her dentist appointment was. And, and had I called my sister, my sister's in England. It's not like I can just pick up the phone and call her whenever I want. The thing is that... What really, what really got me, like I just, I wanted to scream the, when I, when her, when I heard her ask about the dentist appointment and I just said, okay, so it's next Tuesday. It's on the calendar. Just look on the calendar. And then she asked me what time it was at. Eight o'clock. And, you know, and I'm the one that's going to take you there. So um, don't worry about it. I will take you there before I go to work, which is where I am now, which is where you keep calling me and I can't get any work done. So if you can just please look on the calendar and check the time and the date, it, it, so things would it be... it sounds like a lot of changes here that are really frustrating. Yes. I'm just going to find out from Suzanne if there's any details she needs to know about what mom does in the situation. Oh, okay. And then what we're going to do is just practice how it went, okay? Okay. Is there any details? Yeah. So is is there like a repetitive loop, loop? Does she keep repeating, asking you again, how often you're, you know, are you coming? Are you coming over? When's my dentist appointment? Does she just keep repeating those questions? Exactly. And uh, what's her tone like? Is she, does she get louder, more anxious, or is she just like it's like she never said it before? Exactly. Like she's never said it before. Like she's oblivious to the fact that she's already called and she's already asked those questions. And when the conversation starts, mm -hmm. how does she, does she greet you? Does she say hello dear, hello Harriet, or is it just, are you coming over today? It's Harriet, are you coming over today? Just, just like that. Okay. And then how did it end, the conversation? Well, I just got really upset and I put the phone down and I just ran to the washroom and I just cried my eyes out. So you just hung up on her? Yeah, I felt 
really badly about that. And we were, you're on the phone? Yes, yeah. I think I have enough. Okay. So we might not have strategies to change mum, but we might be able to give some strategies to you mm -hmm. so you can end the call feeling a bit different. Okay. Because this call happened on the phone, mm -hmm. I'm going to get you and Suzanne to change your chairs around just so you're back to back because on the phone you can't see another person oh, and that right. would be helpful now. Okay. So I'll get you to change your chairs. I might time out mm -hmm. and just so I can give feedback. But if you're feeling uncomfortable or if, you know, things aren't going how they'd go at home, you can time out too. Okay. Does that sound okay? The first time we're just gonna do it exactly how it happened when you were at work. So whenever you're ready, I'll get you to change your chairs and you can start. Ring, ring, ring. Hello? Hello, Harriet. Are you coming over? Um, later on, Mom. Yes, I'll be there. Is today my laundry day? No, today's not your laundry day. There, there's signs all over the apartment. It's You know that it's next Tuesday, right? Oh, and, and when's my dentist appointment? That is also next Tuesday. Okay, I've already told you before, and it's right on the calendar. So just look at the calendar. What time is it? Your, your appointment is eight, but you really need to look at the calendar. Just remember, we, we went to the calendar and we wrote it down. I showed you where the calendar is. Are, are you coming over today? Well, I just, I just told you, yes, I'll come over later. Let's Wait. time out there. How is this for you? I just, I, 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 I just, I don't, I don't understand. I just, I just don't get it. It's, 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 it's frustrating. Like the same questions over and over again. It sounds really frustrating. Yeah. Is it okay if we check in with Suzanne on how that was for her? Yes, yes. Well, your tone, you, you sounded a bit exasperated to me. So I felt that you really weren't happy to hear from me. And that made me sad. Also, when you kept telling me that you'd already told me things, like the laundry day and when my dentist point was, I felt kind of foolish uh, for not knowing. Oh, I, I mean, I, I guess I hadn't realized how much it's affected her, or just didn't want to admit it. With your mom's dementia at this stage, while she can manage many things, it sounds like her brain's forgetting things, like to check the calendar or times of appointments. And when she's calling you, it's kind of like you're her external brain. She knows that she can count on you and that you're the one who remembers these things. So when she's asking you again and again, she might not remember how many times she's asked you, but she doesn't remember that information, but she knows you do. So it's new information for her. And I don't, I don't want to upset her. No. So there's a couple different strategies. One of them you might even use sometimes is deciding how many times you can answer the call. So sometimes mom's call might go to voicemail or you might call mom a certain number of times a day. For the strategies when you do talk to mom, even though it can be hard because you've had the conversation maybe several times, but finding a way to provide that information without saying remember, because for her this might be the first time she's had that conversation, or at least that's her experience of it. You might need to have a couple breaths in there too, just so you feel that you can answer mom's question and still pay attention to your own feelings too. If you were to try it again, is there something you think you could try differently? Um, I can, I guess, I mean, certainly when I just did it there, I, I felt like it was, I wasn't as hard on her as I was when I actually talked to my mom. Um, but I don't want to upset her, so I guess I could be gentler. Oh. So maybe changing your tone of voice and taking some of those breaths for you? Yeah. Okay. Can we try it again and see how it goes? Okay. Okay. Whenever you're ready. All right. Bring, bring, bring. Hello? Hello, Harriet. Are you coming over today? Uh, yes, I'll be there later on, Mom. Oh, is my laundry day today? 
No, your laundry day is next Tuesday and there are three signs that are posted in the apartment. When's my dentist appointment? Mom, remember when we went to the calendar and we put it on I'm together? gonna time out. Okay. That was a lot different. How did it feel for you? Um, well, it, it, it felt calmer for me. That's good. Yeah. Suzanne, how did that feel for you? Yeah, when you greeted me warmly, mm -hmm. I felt that you're really happy to hear from me and that made me feel happy. Um, nice, it was nice. Uh, however, when you kept saying remember, I started to feel a little confused and a bit anxious and mm -hmm. a little bit agitated. Oh, what's it like to get that feedback? Well, it's, it's kind of hard to hear because I guess it's, it's what's going on with her. It's not she's doing it on purpose. Both of you have feelings around it. So yeah. mom's not doing it on purpose, but you also can't repeat the same answers maybe all day, every day. Great tone of voice, okay. the gentler tone of voice. One of the things might be to distract mom. Mm -hmm. So is there another way to connect with her about something that she likes? What does mom like to talk about? Oh, her cat. <laughs> so yeah. maybe when mom's stuck in this loop, yeah. One of the ways to get her out of that loop is to distract her by something she likes to talk about. Okay. It means you might get to talk about something a bit more pleasant. Mom's getting a pleasant conversation with you, mm -hmm. and you're not having to answer those questions too, too many times. Do you think you could try it one more time? Sure. Okay, let's go in and try it whenever you're ready. Yeah. Bring, bring, bring. Hello? Hello, Harriet, are you coming over today? Uh, yes, Mom, later on I will be there. Is today my laundry day? Actually, next Tuesday is your laundry day. When's my dentist appointment? Your dentist appointment is also next week. You know, Mom, I was wondering something. I was, remember you were talking about the cat, and I just wanted to know how the cat was doing. Oh, uh, g good, good. Oh, that's so good to hear. I know how much you love the cat. That's so sweet. I'm gonna time out there. So I'm going to pause it there. Uh, so this video really gives a sense, as I as I said earlier, about what what we do in the group. We tend to do it once as uh, as it happened, and then go through it uh, two, sometimes three more times, so that the the caregiver has a, a an opportunity to practice this. Um, a few times and we don't know if that challenge is going to come up again in the same way but the idea is learning some of these different communication skills for example the um, the tone of voice um, the uh, not saying remember uh, trying to find other topics to try to get out of that loop as they talked about um, and we we make a list and build on that list um, as we go through the weeks and another um, common one is trying to take a breath to calm yourself down before um, engaging with the, the person living with dementia. Um, in the, the final week of the carers group is where we could either go back to do another, um, another PST, problem solving uh, techniques session, or we could do another simulation depending on what, um, what the group members want to learn about. And I think the, the main takeaway of what we're really trying to do in, in both of these groups, and especially in the carers group, is really help the caregiver to see that um, they need to be the one to adapt to the needs of the person living with dementia rather than trying to get uh, the person living with dementia to, to change or to be more like they used to be. And I always like to say that it's easy for me to say that, but it's a lot harder to, um, after usually decades of people interacting with each other in a certain way, having certain expectations and certain um, patterns of behavior and communication to then suddenly um, have to learn these new things. It can be like learning a new language, which we all know can take uh, a long time. So in these groups, we really try to make this a supportive and safe environment where people can feel um, that it's okay to admit when they've um, made mistakes or uh, when they've acted in ways that aren't really um, in keeping with their values and with their goals of care for the, the person that they're supporting and learn to, to do things differently. Um, I think this would be a good time to pass things over to you, Cheryl, to uh, to talk a bit more about um, about the program in terms of. Um, okay, actually, I popped on early, um, Katie, because I, I wanted to 
comment on the video. I think you, you know, you, you highlighted what it is that we're doing, but when I watch these video again, I haven't seen them for a long time. I want people to know that the, the person that was playing the role of a clinician is, is an enhancing care clinician. And the person playing the role of the simulated patient is a simulated patient. So I wanna draw your attention to the great care that they take with the caregivers, the, the skill, the competence, the empathy, the patience, the, you know, just hanging in there with the caregiver through the process. This is kind of, you know, it's hard to describe carers groups to people, but this is the qualitative difference between what happens in these group to some other psychoeducational groups. Not that there's a place for all of that, but I think that, you know, this video really shows so many things, but but the the people that were playing the role of the clinician and the SP, that is what they do in their groups every day. That is that that is the approach, that is the level of empathy, patience, skill. So that's just my plug for the people. <laughs> um, I think that also speaks to the 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 training that we go through, where we do yes. have those simulated patients in our um, in our training as well, mm -hmm. um, which is a really um, I think a really intense process um, that we go through to make sure that we're able to run uh, run these groups according to the the standard that the the Reitman Center has set. Yeah, yeah. I joke with the the SPs that we should have our own awards ceremony for the SPs because they're so good at recreating the situation and drawing out the emotion and and all of that. So so thank you, Katie, for sharing that video. Um, just in terms of what's going on with the province and you know where to find out about where the partner site locations are, who to call and all of that. So we've developed kind of a one-stop website. It's caresontario.ca. And there's some general information about cares and teach. But more importantly, I think for most of you across the provinces, you know, where do we access this program in our area? So on the website, we have a map. So we've pinpointed areas where the, the program partners provide the service. But keep in mind, all of the program partners also provide a virtual service. So even though we can pinpoint locations where some of the uh, programs have been in person, all of the sites offer virtual services. So there, for each site, there's a page and we have who to call, the number to call, an email and the referral information. So you can download the referral form if that's what's required from the organization. There's not a standard process across the province. It really depends on the organization. Yes, and I, I did want to add with uh, for us here at the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, people can access the group in different ways. They might be referred by um, by one of our social workers or care navigators or through our intake team. They might sign up from our event calendar. They can register for the group, but that means they um, what they're really doing is expressing interest and we then get in touch with them. Uh, so what we do here is first a, a phone based screening where we're really just asking, can you tell me a bit about your current situation and can you tell me about any group experience you've had? And the reason I, I like to ask that is because sometimes people might think, oh, yes, someone told me I should do a group or I it seems like a good idea. But when I ask them about, you know, what do you think it would be like to be in a group um, of your peers in that you're all caring for someone living with dementia and hearing their challenges and what they're going through, in addition to then not e only being invited, but being expected to also share uh, your own challenges. And that sometimes causes people to self-select out of um, out of uh, the possibility of a group at that time because they're dealing with their own challenges and they feel they can't either they can't take on hearing other people or they're not at a space where they feel they could really talk about it wouldn't be helpful to talk with a group about it. Um, if it seems like one of the groups or both groups could be helpful, we then do an assessment and this can be um, done in person at one of our offices or it can be done uh, online via Zoom. We don't do them over the phone. We really need to see the uh, the potential group member. And it is a, a psycho, um, psychosocial assessment. So we're asking about um, some health issues they might have and uh, the person living with dementia. We want to know about their, um, their living environment. We want to know about their support network, both informal and formal, uh, mental health challenges, a bit about their, their background, the history of their 
uh, relationship. If it's um if it's a couple, we want to know how they met. Um, we want to know about any uh, family dynamics that might be helpful to be aware of, because that also informs how we can support these um, people in the group. Um, I always like to say that my role is to connect the right person to the right group at the right time. And I also like to also um, acknowledge when I do get a, a group of people together to um, to just acknowledge that they they've put trust in me that I think the group is going to be helpful for them. I know how the group is going to go. I know what to expect, but they really don't. So it sometimes can feel like a, a leap of faith that they're going to invest their time and energy and, and their emotions into these groups in the hopes that it is going to have um, a positive impact on them. And I sometimes hear, and I just this morning heard from someone who said, we're, we're still meeting, we're still getting together. Um, our, our cohort of, um, our, of five in a, in a group are still getting together because they really felt that um, that connection and it really built during the, uh, the four weeks that we were together in the, uh, the teach group. Um, I'm going to, again, uh, pass it back to you, Cheryl, to talk about um, the different uh, the different sites that that offer the uh, enhancing care program. So here's a list of um, all of our partner sites. So in central, we have Alzheimer Society York Region and Alzheimer Society Simcoe County. In east, we have Alzheimer Society Durham Region, Providence Care and Geriatric Community Services of Ottawa. And both Providence Care and Geriatric Community Services Vada both provide groups in French. Um, in the West, we have Alzheimer's Society Windsor Essex, Alzheimer's Society Sardinia and Lambton, Alzheimer's Society Southwest Partners, and Alzheimer's Society Waterloo Wellington. In the Northwest, we have St. Joseph's Care Group and CMHA Fort Francis, providing services in Kenora and Dryden. In Northeast, we have Alzheimer's Society, Sudbury, Manitoulin, North Bay. And here in Toronto, we have Reitman Centre team at Sinai Health and Katie's group at Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. And the, the last thing I wanted to mention was um, that site that Cheryl was talking about earlier where you can click on the on the specific site. So here is the one for, um, for AST as an example, where you can see we offer both groups um, and it's for people who are either living in the M postal code or caring for someone living in the M postal code. Uh, we also, if, if someone kind of happens, um, happens to find their way to AST, but they might be living in a different catchment, we then connect them. And I've, I've um, gotten in touch with Cheryl on more than one occasion to find out where um, which uh, appropriate site might um, I should send them to. Uh, with AST, people don't need a, um, I'm not sure if this is across the province, so please correct me if I'm wrong, Cheryl, but people don't uh, need a referral from a doctor. Uh, they can self-refer to our um, to our program, and they can also complete a referral form from the main page of our website. Um, for any of you wanting to make uh, referrals as well, you can uh, connect with the um, the Alzheimer's Society or the closest site directly uh, to make that referral, and from there we can get in touch with uh, with the um, with the care partner. That's right. And for any site that there might be on the map that there's no pinpoint and you're not sure, um, the Reitman Center at Sinai Health is always the go-to for any areas where. Uh, there's some uncertainty or we don't have a specific care provider, we we provide virtual service for any of the gaps in the province. Yes, we don't want uh, geography to be a barrier for anyone to participate. And we sometimes will say, you know, I am running a, a long-term care specific group, which might not be offered throughout the province and someone from uh, from outside of our catchment area, as long as they're, they're in the province of Ontario, will uh, we will be able to attend. So we do try to support people um, in that way to be connected to the group. Um, and on that note, um, I wonder if anyone has any uh, any questions for uh, for me or for Cheryl about the Enhancing Care program. One thing I will just add is that um, we have capacity to support more people in groups. So typically we don't have a wait list. And if if people are waiting in another area and there's capacity in, an, in a different area with a virtual group, we can get people into groups. So, so don't hesitate uh, to make a referral or to encourage people to self-refer. 
we do have ca capacity now to support people in groups. Thank you so much, Cheryl and Katie. So now uh, we're just gonna open up for questions using the Q&A or chat box. So there's some questions in the Q&A. First is uh, the program used to have a program for the carers loved ones, i.e. persons with dementia running at the same time as the carers group so that finding someone to look after the person with dementia was not a barrier to the carers entry. Is this still the case? Um, it can be depending on the site. So that uh, that respite is one of the R's in, uh, in carers where we, um, or the, the site offering the group will provide uh, respite. So yes, the caregiver can participate and in a separate space at the same location, um, we will have someone, a staff person or, or a volunteer. We are able to offer that at the Alzheimer Society of Toronto um, and it's worked successfully. We do use volunteers who have been trained uh, to support a person living with dementia and they will do some activities. Um, it might be drawing, it might be, um, um, might be listening to music. It's really what we learn a little bit about the person before um, before they join. Uh, it's happened once since the the pandemic that we were able to offer the respite and, and it was needed um, and it was really successful. So it is something we we try to offer on a regular basis if it is uh, if it is needed. And I'm not sure Cheryl throughout the rest of the province how common that is. So it really depends on the site. So again, it would it's really important to touch base with the site that's offering it in your area. Um, a lot of sites are partnering with day programs to pr provide the respite. Um, you know, the, Re the Reitman Center used to have their own group running during CARES time. So it really just depends. But yes, in some cases, there are there is um, some type of respite available. Great. Um, next question is about um, whether the program is offered in different languages. I know at AST we have offered the teach group in um, in Cantonese. It really depends on the the languages spoken by the the people who have been trained. Um, currently, it is only it's I am the lead in the program, and I have a colleague who also runs groups, and both of us are only English speaking. But beyond AST, um, I'm wondering, Cheryl. I know French is sometimes one of the the languages we offer. Yeah, so both the Geriatric Psychiatry Community Services Ottawa and Providence Care can offer programs in French. We haven't seen um, a huge demand for that. Um, the Wellness Centre out of Sinai Health offers programs in Cantonese and probably uh, by the end of the year, we'll also be able to offer programs in Mandarin. Um, we have had some interest in other languages, but there just doesn't seem to be the demand. So if you are interested or you know of a group of caregivers that are looking um, in, for a specific language, this is something we can definitely consider and plan for. We would, we would not only need to look for um, the clinician that could speak the language, but we'd also have to train an SP as well. So it takes a little bit of coordination, but if there is demand and enough, you know, enough people in an area or even virtually across the province, it's definitely something we could look at. Great. Um, another person asks, um, so the carer can choose between virtual or in person. Yes, so at AST, we, we plan quarterly for the groups we're going to offer, and we aim to run three carers groups and two teach groups each quarter, and we really vary um, what we offer. So right now, we're hoping to um, offer an in-person spousal carers group um, and an online spousal carers group. We had hoped to offer one for friends and family, but we didn't quite have enough interest. And we, we'd we like to run groups with a minimum of five people, because if you do have someone cancel or and another person cancel or is sick, um, it's a smaller group and it's not as rich of an experience for the, the caregivers. Um, so we really look at the people who are on our list who have expressed interest or who have already been assessed when we're planning the groups to try to make sure um, we're offering what people need. And we also have to think about locations. So I'm right here at our um, at our main office at Young and Eglinton, which is quite popular. But we also have a satellite, two satellite offices that are in the East and in Scarborough, um, and that there's been mixed interest uh, in running groups there. So. Um, 
it gets to be a little bit complicated trying to make sure we have the right person at the right place and the right time. So a lot of time goes into trying to plan these um, plan these groups. And if it doesn't work out for one uh, one session, we might provide some individual sessions until we're able to connect uh, the person to um, to a group that will work better for them. Yeah, I think it varies across it varies across the province and um, depending on what's available at a certain site. You know, some sites like Sudbury right now, they're mostly running um, in person groups. So up there, there may be less option for virtual. But if people are willing to join a virtual group from another area, you know, if Katie was running a virtual group at a time that would suit the caregiver in Sudbury, then we're flexible and we try to find a, a spot for somebody. It also varies, I think, depending on the season. In the fall, we had lots of people who wanted yeah. in-person groups. And now it seems like, I guess, because of the, the weather and the season, um, it's more more interest is in uh, online groups. So I might actually change one of my groups to be from, uh, from in-person to online, depending on, um, again, the interest. I'd rather push the group by a few weeks and then cancel it all together and in the hopes that I'm able to run the group. Um, Teresa Judd. Hi, Teresa. Um, in the chat says, um, thank you so much for an excellent session. I would like to connect with Katie to discuss more options in the Central West geography, accessibility and frequency of offerings. So she put her email there. I don't know if you can see that, Katie. So if sure, you can make a vote, that would be great. Um, any other questions or comments from um, the participants on today? And again, feel free to use the Q&A our chat box, you can see that a poll has popped up for feedback as well. Again, this is anonymous feedback. Katie, I have some um, information on Central West if you wanna to touch base with me about the call. <laughs> sure. Okay, well, we're just getting last minute of polls. We do have a few more minutes. So again, um, I'll give it maybe another minute if you are typing. We're getting a thank you. Very interesting topic from Adolfa. Hi, Adolfa. Thank you for that. Any other um, questions or comments? Okay, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you to the presenters for the very useful content um, and very helpful for all of us, I think, on today. Um, just a quick reminder that if you would like a certificate of attendance, please complete the brief evaluation survey, which will be emailed to you. The recording will be available on the Ontario CLRI and BSO websites. And uh, once again, thank you to the speakers and thank you everyone for um, joining us today for our behavior support rounds. Thank you. Thank you for having us today.